Greetings, errants, glitches, breakaways, thought criminals, and genuinely open-minded and outright curious inhabitants of whatever simulacrum we find ourselves navigating at the moment. You are about to set sail on another free first hour episode of The Melt. If you find yourself wanting to dig deeper and have the desire to join the conversation during our monthly Melt meetups, you might want to consider becoming a monthly subscriber. For a measly five dead presidents per month, you can have access to full-length, early, and exclusive episodes. Just click the Patreon or Locals link in the episode notes below to create the timeline that will set it all in motion. It's suspiciously simple, altogether painless, and just might inspire feelings of bliss and or lingering euphoria. So, without further ado, let the conversations begin! This is Hunter Muse. And this is Chris Snipes. And you are listening to The Melt. The astounding story of Seattle attorney Andrew Bashago and his childhood experiences as a chrononaut with Project Pegasus, where he claims to have been sent back into time where he advised George Washington, revisited Lincoln's assassination several times, was present on the day of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, and also that he is teleported to Mars with a younger Barack Obama. These claims, on paper and out of context, sound outlandish until you hear them come out of Bashago's mouth. Within the context of his demeanor and tone, these claims seem not only credible, but perhaps even possible. He's appeared on countless radio and TV shows and podcasts throughout the better part of this last couple of decades, and he ran for president in 2012 and 2016. I start off the conversation by asking Andrew about his story, starting with his involvement with the DARPA Time Exploration Project Pegasus. I'm a lawyer, a writer, a public speaker a media personality, and in 2016, a presidential candidate, probably best known for serving in DARPA's Project Pegasus as one of the chrononauts in that program and in the Defense Department's Project Mars as an astronaut. Um, Project Pegasus was a classified defense-related research and development program that was attempting to develop different modalities of time travel and succeeded. But I entered the program in 1968 when I teleported from the old Curtis Wright Aeronautical uh, Company facility in Woodridge, New Jersey, to Santa Fe, New Mexico, with my late father, Raymond F. Bishago who was one of the project principals, so that we could meet with Dr. Harold M. Agnew at the Los Alamos National Labs in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Agnew was a brilliant physicist who had participated really in all critical stages of Project Manhattan, the project to build the atomic bomb. He had, as a prized physics pupil of Dr. Enrico Fermi at the University of Chicago. He had been one of the uh, graduate students who was tasked with manipulating the graphite rods so that the 
critical pile would not go critical uh, and that potentially explode. Um, and then he was in Los Alamos when the atomic bomb was designed and built. Mm-hmm. And he was at Trinity site in Alamogordo when the bomb was tested. He took the nuclear trigger from Los Alamos to the island of Tinian, where it was put uh, in the plane of Captain Paul Tibbetts in terms of the, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. And he even calibrated the magnitude of the first atomic bomb attack, the, the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima, from a chase plane behind the Enola Gay that Kibitz was piloting called um, the, um, oh gosh, what was the name of that thing? The chase plane was called the Great Artiste. So, you know, the Defense Department put probably the person most responsible for achieving nuclear weapons, namely Agnew, and in the role of being the federal science administrator of Project Pegasus. So in the years after the war, they knew they had this technology because, of course, the um, the paperwork of Nikola Tesla was seized by the War Department rather than the FBI. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it still is at Los Alamos. So they decided to basically herald <clears throat> all of the potential destructiveness of nuclear weapons to intimidate other countries into not pursuing another world war, certainly a subject that's on our mind today after this relatively uh, potentially disastrous event in, in the Middle East. Yes. Another, another uh, Pearl Harbor, if you will. Yeah. Potentially. And, um, but they decided to not herald what they were developing in the area of time travel because it gave it a very, you know, our government, a real advantage over other countries. They would know what the future held. So I was brought in unofficially in winter of 1968 when my dad took me to New Mexico to meet Dr. Agnew. And from his desk there, he said to my dad, how was your trip? And my dad said, fine and fast. And Agnew looked up smiling and he said, oh, did you take the teleporter? And my dad said, yes, so did my number three son, uh, Andrew. And they both looked over at me and Dr. Agnew asked my father regarding me, how old? And my dad and I said, six. So that initial teleportation that I experienced between New Jersey and New Mexico had to have taken place sometime between September 18th of 1967, 68, because I would turn seven on uh, 9-18-68. I was born on September 18th of 1961. So we're absolutely sure that Essentially, based on Agnew's answer, my my dad said, have you tried it yet? And Agnew said, no, but I want to. Well, look, if the if the director at that time, he was the director of the the weapons division at the labs. If if a principal physicist in the principal bomb factory, the most important factory within the atomic research community, knew of this technology, but had not yet tried it that's a pretty good measure of when teleportation was operational within what's known as the defense technical community. My dad's part of that community. He had a BS in electrical engineering uh, from Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and was a, a, a really gifted mathematician and knew a lot about physics. Um, 
And, and so it, that sort of explains John G. Trump, the uncle of President Trump. Always this, this electrical engineering, math, and physics connection to these people tied up in the uh, nascent uh, time travel program. I am not gifted in those subjects, even though I took advanced math slash operations research under the Naval Postgraduate School um, from 1981 to 83 when I was earning my my principal degree, which was in history. Um, I'm more of a social scientist than a scientist, but was a chrononaut during the emergence of time travel. Low, now what? I mean, those experiences were roughly from 1968 to 72. So what, 51 years have passed since my activities in Project Pegasus ended. So we're really talking about pretty ancient history now. You know, I'm, I'm often called, well, the time-traveling lawyer or what have you. <laughs> no, I, I've been lawyering um, from 1996 uh, when I passed the Washington Bar till about 2019 when my vision became so poor that I could not practice and I'm currently inactive. But I would was being called, you know, the time traveling lawyer. I was a law I was a current lawyer who had time traveled during the emergence of time travel yes. as a child and then had gone to Mars in my late teens and early twenties. But those those two experiences are ancient history even in my life. So um yet I've kind of made a, a secondary career as an attorney doing literally hundreds of of radio shows and, and many uh, mainstream, you know, network TV shows. Um, one's coming up, in fact, on the 13th, but I can't, I can't state what it is because I'm on a security, I'm on a confidentiality agreement. Darn it. But I've, I've done a lot of, uh, a lot of radio. This is probably about my, I don't know, 600th show. Wow. So, yeah. So I, my goal was not really to reveal the technical secrets of this country. I was actually in a bind. You know, in 20 years ago this year, I had somebody at CIA who I knew in New Mexico. At that, I went out there. And uh, somebody from the executive office of uh, President George W. Bush said, Andy, if you if you continue to investigate, write about, or talk about this program, in light of the fact that the time travel devices involved remain sensitive and compartmentalized national security secrets, we cannot guarantee your survival. Now wait a minute. They didn't really give me enough information to know whether I was being warned by the executive office of President George W. Bush or threatened. And I felt if I didn't talk, I might be killed. Like, for example, Danny Casolaro, the journalist, uh, was because he knew everything about the octopus. So I thought, well, if I talk and talk a lot, they won't be able to kill me because they'll bring attention to what I was saying. Yeah. So I went on a I went on a spree of talking and I think that was my right to do because I had not really requested being in the program. I was not officially serving in the military although I was told I had been made a lieutenant in the navy when I was in the 3rd grade. But I was placed in a sense of compartmentalized situation, they denied me my pay. Uh, in fact, my dad and the Army adjutant, Curtis Wright, had a, an hour-long argument when we went there to sign the paperwork for my, my salary, essentially. They were going to put money in trust to my 25th birthday, which would have been 9 18 86. And I thought, well, you know, what should I do here to stay alive? And I just, I had to talk. Now, in the process, 
I believe I actually ended up protecting the country because what I did is inform some of the very countries that we may be in a third world war with fairly soon or certainly inevitably or ultimately. I advise them that they should not attack this country because we're going to know, know about it before they do. And that's because we have a quantum access capability and have had one fully operational for over 50 years. So I think the irony of what happened after 2003, when I was given this momentous threat or warning, uh, is I ended up protecting the country anyway. Because I believe that China and Russia and Iran and uh, North Korea and any of the other potentially adversary countries who were listening um, understood what I was saying. If you attack us, we're going to know about it before you do it. And that's the, that's the defense potential that our Defense Department was not employing because of the abuse of official state secrecy. Secrecy is not often a good thing. Why not brag about what you have? We did it with the bomb. Has anybody bombed us with nuclear weapons? No. So I believe we should have also heralded our time travel capability, which I've been doing for the last 20 years. Well, how did that, how did you actually get into the program? I mean, there had to be, I'm assuming that there had to be a situation where you were given a choice where you could say yes or no. Do you want to do this? And no, no, no? it wasn't actually. Oh. Yeah. During that era, then we got to think of the cold war context of the childhood of those of us down in our sixties and seventies and older. The cold war was on. And you may recall that, um, Admiral Hyman Ricco, the mentor of president Carter, started something called Project Talent. Um, that was an effort to identify American children of extraordinary IQ, psychic ability, and leadership potential. That was the origin of that week plus a Saturday morning of testing that we all had. And after the that testing would be held, and we do that last uh, component on Saturday mornings, we would get the the pen with the four four colors. Um, it was a like a ballpoint pen that had, yeah. had black, blue, mm-hmm. red, and ink. Yeah, mm-hmm. I remember this. Our spirograph. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, to make images. Um, clearly, uh, my dad had passed my name along to the Defense Department when I was three because he saw me levitating my toys and I actually had them spinning like planets in space. Uh, but I, I took part in all that testing and I'm fairly sure based on the IQ, I was told I had gotten during the Otis Lemming and the Stanford Binet IQ test that I was high IQ. I was 168 and psychic ability was advanced. I was one of the American school children that the Office of Naval Intelligence asked to tell them, was Lieutenant Commander John McCain uh, in the Hanoi Hilton, the POW compound in, uh, in Hanoi, known as the Hanoi Hilton? And if so, where was he in the building that they thought he was in? And I went home after that meeting and had an extensive amount of dream, dreaming of where uh, Senator McCain was being kept in North Vietnam. Now, at that time, McCain's father, John Sidney McCain Sr., was the commander of the entire Pacific Fleet of the U.S. Navy. So I know in addition to high IQ, I had been identified as very psychic. I mean, my dad had witnessed me go down to the cellar where he had a carpentry shop and say to him, when I heard him sort of ruminating about his marriage to my mom, they had been apparently arguing about their uh, their IRS uh, filing uh, 
the filing of their taxes was always uh, an invitation for my parents to be having an argument. And I heard him saying to himself that my mom just viewed him as a, as a meal ticket. And I said to my dad, at about age three, I said, Dad, you shouldn't say that. Mom doesn't view you just as a meal ticket. She, she really loves you. And he realized, <laughs> he realized I was reading his mind. So he, he said, Amscre, and he chased me upstairs. So I know that my psychic abilities were being detected by my father and other adults. Um, I, in fact, in early childhood, I was even inhibited to sit next to somebody on a couch because I thought they'd be able to read my mind because I was reading other people's minds. I had many dreams that would come true, and I um, I remain what is it, psychokinesis? Mm -hmm. I'll sit under a lamp um, at our at our dining room table, and it'll, it'll start going on the blink. I'll go past a a microwave oven, and it'll it'll fail or go on the blink. I I recently, not intending to, disabled our TV set. So, and in fact, when I was working in a gas station when I was 20, two Defense Department officials came in and ordered the station manager and chief mechanic to allow me to have no contact with electronics. Why, I don't know, but hmm. I've been very psychokinetic during my life. And I have no idea why I, I am. Um, could be a past life influence or, I don't know, something that happened in, in utero. But I have almost always caused microwave ovens to go on the blink. And a lot of TV says. So they knew I, I was psychic. And I did find where Lieutenant Commander McCain was. And um, I tried to meet with him in 08 when he's running for president and I did not uh, succeed at, at reaching him um, to fill him in on the fact that his dad had psychic kids in New Jersey looking for him. So um, I was kind of brought in to the secret testing of that era on the basis that I think I qualified for two of the three things that Project Talent T A L E N T was looking for, which is high IQ and high psychic ability. Whether I possessed high leadership potential, we'll have to see if I am elected president, as I told I, I was told I would at a certain point. Um, so that's essentially how I was brought in the program. My dad was actually told by an army official who visited him at work. And, uh, in fact, my dad took me out to the general manufacturing company facility in convent station, New Jersey, after that army officer visited him at work and told him I would be in the program. Now, when you're dealing with time travel, there's kind of a convolution if you use chronovision, for example, to see something in the future, and then you task somebody to do that thing, which comes first, the view of what they did or the tasking and their performance of that time travel? For a number of paradoxes like that that I directly confronted in when I was formally placed in Project Pegasus, in fall of 1969, when I was becoming age eight and entering the third grade. Um, one was, they were using the chronovisors. Now, let me just, just explain what those were. Yeah, those were electro-optical devices where they would put an electric, electromagnetic signal through eight-sided bismuth crystals and a cube, cubicle hologram would pop out. If we were outside that hologram, it surely was a looking glass, as it's been called. But that's not really the significance of the chronovisor. If we were in the in the hologram when it was generated 
we spontaneously went that time and place. Now, in the case of going back to brief General George Washington to retreat his troops from New York Harbor, which I did leaving in the fall of uh, 1970 from Morris Plains, New Jersey, um, and arriving there in August of 1776, they had been using cro- the chronovisors to compare what the what chronovision was recovering about the true lives of historical figures like Washington, Lincoln, Jesus of Nazareth, and other undisputable luminaries of their time. And they did it with Washington. They saw me advising him. In other words, they went into his encampment uh, at Brooklyn Heights, and they saw me actually giving him a demarche to retreat his troops from New York Harbor. But in real time, back in the present, they analyzed that data, and they had me memorize what they had had me say to him. And then I went, and I advised Washington to retreat his troops from New York Harbor. I gave him a lot of information about the Revolutionary War, how he was destined to win it, how he was destined to be known as the father of his country, how indeed the capital of that great country that his success in the war would lead to the founding of the United States of America, how they would name it Washington in his honor. But I was also advised to say that none of those propitious things would happen, sir, General Washington, unless you retreat your troops immediately from New York Harbor. Well, Washington could not really get his mind around what we meant by the fact that we were time travelers from his future. And he quizzed me extensively, um, but then ultimately realized what we, who we were and what we were telling him. And he just stood up and decisively said, I shall order the retreat immediately. I was very impressed by Washington. He was truly an, an immaculate person, a very impressive person. And But see, they sent me because they had filmed chronovisor footage of me advising him. So you have to ask, which came first? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we don't, we can't really answer that question. Um, yes, the thing that they had already taped is what they would send me in the future to go say to Washington. And what I said to him is what I had memorized of what they had me say. But it, see, this is the paradox of time travel. When you are sent From the future, our present to the past, and you implement or confirm, so to speak, what you've done, we you 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 defeat linear causation and replace it with what I call circular causation, and that is a a, you know now a known paradox of time travel. But I didn't say what I was motivated to say or had said. I went to say what I would say, but they had footage of it, you see, because of the nonlinear nature of quantum access. It sounds like they almost, I mean, it sounds like they wanted you to go and reenact something that had already happened, which would make one ask why would that need to happen since it seems to have already happened see but that's a linear that's an analysis that's understandable sure but that's based on our linear understanding of time and space true true we have a sense of since we develop object permanence as infants but that's not what happened what they did is they sent me to deliver the first time what they already had footage of me delivering because they had time travel, you see? So that defeats linear causation. I went and did what they had footage of that I would do. And so I did it. So we don't, we, 
we know that I we, we know that I told Washington what DARPA had recorded me saying. But when you have this kind of circular causation, what actually originated the words is somewhat mysterious. It kind of came from the depths of time and space itself. Maybe it came from my mind. I, I don't know, or somebody else's mind. But I ended up giving a demarche that they knew I would give, not that they knew I had given. But yes, if you look at it from the perspective of 1970 vis-a-vis -vis, uh, 17, August of 1776, yes, in August of 70, 1776, I had given it. But I had to go and give it for it to exist in the time-space continuum. And there is a time-space continuum. So it, it's really an irresolvable paradox. It, it almost sounds like a Mobius strip of causation. Yes, and in fact, they had Steve Schwartz, the gifted psychic researcher, have us play around with Mobius strips when I was in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. I, I worked with Steve Schwartz at an appearance I did at the Rafa School of Enlightenment under Jay-Z Knight up in Yelm, Washington, I, which I believe was an appearance I did in uh, like February 12 of 2011. And I thought, my God, this is the guy that I met as a, in kindergarten. And he showed us Mobius strips. But yes, they were having us play with Mobius strips so we would have our mind wrapped around these uh, quantum paradoxes that we would encounter in the program. I have a question, Andrew. I'm so curious about your mother and the relationship between uh, your father and your mother. How did they meet? They were introduced by a couple, the Cubics, Raymond Cubic and Doris Cubic. Uh, Ray Kubik was my dad's supervisor at many engineering companies. Uh, Curtis Wright, C.F. Braun, and Parsons. And Mrs. Kubik worked with my mom at Ciccone Mobile. And they were introduced on a blind date in February of 1955. And according to the Kubiks, sort of walked hand in hand in front of them and fell in love. And they married six months later in, in August of 1955. So they are a couple that met on a blind date. Do you think that they were placed together? You know, I know this is kind of hard to conject, but as some type of an experiment to, to see what type of children they would produce, is that possible? It's possible, but I have no evidence of it. My mm -hmm. mom was a very loving woman and had had some college. Um, my dad was a really brilliant engineer and mathematician. In fact, one of his colleagues from Parsons said to me at my dad's services in 1990, you know, Andrew, if your dad had been a better communicator, um, he would have become president of Parsons. Mm -hmm. So... I don't think it was an experiment. It could have been, but I, I don't have any evidence of that. I think they would have used perhaps a bride who was an Ivy League graduate or something. Mm -hmm. Because my mom was just not gifted in the areas that my dad was. So I... It's been explained, and I still have a hard time wrapping my my rational, reasonable mind around it, but that time obviously is not a linear point A to point B to point C sort of progression of events, but that all time uh, is happening happening at the same time, concurrently. Um, so, Well, there's a space continuum, and you affect it, you alter it with time travel, because you produce 
the effect before the cause. And that's very paradoxical to, to, to comprehend. In fact, most people have not been able to comprehend my point about that. You're literally producing an effect before you provided the cause. How could that be? Well, because you're using sophisticated forms of time travel. So, sorry, but... <laughs> Don't be sorry. You're just, you're just the messenger here. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so that would posit. To, I mean, that that would make me think like, okay, if every all time is happening at the same time, then then how can one time travel? What what is being traveled? I mean, is that just a semantical uh, sort of minefield? Really time travel. I prefer the term quantum access. Mm -hmm. um, but. Um, you know, this is the paradox of retro causation and proto causation. Let's use another example for a future data point. If Barack Obama was told he was going to be president and he went to, let's say, David Axelrod and said, Dave, I'm going to be president, so why don't you consider being my campaign manager? Mm -hmm. Which first, their knowledge that Obama was going to win in 2008 or the approach to Axelrod who had the skill and ability to get Obama elected, even yeah. though he had relatively little profile or little mm -hmm. service. Yeah, yeah. You know, he had about, what, uh, 47 votes in the Senate where he had voted present. You know, nobody really knew who Barack Obama was, but Axelrod succeeded at accomplishing what Obama told him the CIA had already informed him of. That would be the paradox of proto-causation. They knew something in the future was going to happen, and they took discrete decisions that did make it happen. So, how did that fall together? The same thing. It was circular causation. Oh, help me get elected, because I know I'm going to be elected. Mm. That's rather... Yeah. I don't know if that's what Obama said to Axelrod, but he certainly could have. He, he could have sold the inevitability of his election to those he was entreating to help him get there. Mm -hmm. Typically, people say, well, you know, please try to get me elected because I'm going to do such great things for the country, right? And they come up with rationales to get them elected. But with those of us who have been informed of our future presidencies, as Obama and I were as early as 1980, his um, happening much earlier than mine, um, it, it, it gets in the area of circular causation. I mean, it can. And you, you, I'm tired of talking about that because people said, when, when I ran in 2016, they said, Andy, what happened? You predicted you were going to be president. I never did any such thing. I said I was told I was going to be the president. Yeah. So I, I didn't make a prediction. I'm, I'm saying I may have with with Axelrod and uh, and others. Uh -huh. And at one point you were you said that you were in a, a, a room, I believe, where all of these people were much younger. Obviously, Clinton, um, George W. Bush. Um, and I can't, I'm, I can't recall who all. No, I, I, yeah. Well, I met, I met both Bushes mm -hmm. at a in, in New Mexico around, I don't know, must've been around 1971. And W was about 25. I was about nine, 10 years old. And he kept on coming up to me and saying, Andy, have you heard my dad and I are going to be president? <laughs> And he was, he was, he was very nice, but very goofy. And his dad kept on saying, "Now, come on, W, don't, don't go there." His dad didn't really like the fact that he was so comedic. Dad said nothing to me, but that indicates that the Bushes had prior knowledge of their presidency. Then there was a smaller lunch, a little bit later. Bill Clinton was on my left. 
And the four guys from the program that were there were my father and his colleague from Ralph M. Parsons, Joseph Connison, but then some real big shots, namely Dr. Agnew, Harold, Harold M. Agnew, and um, Ivan Browning. Browning had been the director of science and technology for the CIA from 1959 to 71, I believe. So there were four really prominent people in the program at lunch with uh, with Bill Clinton and myself. I got a very good vibe from from Bill. And he said, and this is virtually a direct quote, he said, they said, how are you doing with the information, Bill? And he said, well, I, I know you fellows are attached to the atomic research community, and I know you're always doing amazing things like building more destructive nuclear weapons, but I have to tell you, some mornings I get up and I look at myself in the mirror and I have to pinch myself and I say, me, Bill Clinton, President of the United States, well, fellas, that dog don't hunt. And they kind of chuckle. So I do know to an historical certainty that the Bushes and Bill Clinton were given prior knowledge of their presidencies in the early 70s. Then when Obama and I were placed in uh, Project Mars circa 1980, when I was 18 and he would turn 20 that, that August, but I would, I would turn, um, well, you know, in that, in that late teen, early, uh, uh, you know, 20 something age, I, my dad and I drove Obama, by the way, he was using the name Barry Sotoro, not Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. Him from California, where the Mars training program was underway at College of the Siskiyou. And we're driving back, and um, my dad confirmed that Obama and I were destined to be, to be president. In fact, what had happened was we were in the classroom at one point, and Tom Stillings, the father of uh, William Brett Stillings, who was an operations analyst for Lockheed Skunk Works, said to his son Brett, who was like all of 14, he said, Brett, um, what do you think of being in a Mars program like this with a future president? And he, he looked at or pointed to, uh, to Obama. And then without letting Brett answer, my dad looked at me and shoved two fingers into the area between our respective desk, um, you know, aisles, if, if you will. And, um, and said two future presidents. So when we were dropping Obama off at the uh, local airport at the Indian Reservation north of Weed, I think it's either Koopa or Kuma, and I have to look it up. Um, I said to my dad, Dad, do I really become president? And he said, yes, that's what they said. And so does Barry. That's what we're calling Barack Obama was by his birth or his uh, Indonesian name, Barry, so because that's what he told told us his name was. So I I may have sundered my potential by talking, but the bottom line is it was part of my truth campaign to inform the American people that there's a connection between quantum access and the U.S. presidency. In fact, that's one of the only manipulations they really want to participate in. Generally speaking, those on the program, like my late father, did not want to engage in quantum engineering. For example, they knew about the inevitability of the events of 9-11, which were very grievous. I mean, people were jumping off the Twin Towers, right? And I think that they didn't want to engage in quantum engineering in light of knowledge of the future, because it would defeat the benefit of having quantum access. It would start screwing up the timelines. So they decided to just engage in sort of contingency planning 
for future events based on previous you know, quantum access knowledge of future events, but not try to change the future uh, based on knowing about it. But clearly in the case of the presidency, they made an exception. So I think they've been advising every U.S. president since probably um, since Reagan, you know, following, following Reagan. Well, it's interesting, too, because a lot of people in this truth community, whatever you want to call it, posit that um, the presidents come from these long lineages. So in that sense, they're sort of predestined to have one or the other of them uh, take the high political power, highest political power, or high various uh high orders of political power just because of the families that they're involved in. So in that sense, I think that people think that that's predestined because of those circumstances. But the the context that you cast it in, it's more because they foresee it having happened already. Yes, they run, they win, and the government has known it since they've had quantum access. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was in Pegasus. In officially in 1969, fall of 1969, when all of these devices were already fully operational, they were testing those devices on children, not trying to develop them. They were already there. So we had eight modalities of time travel by 1970 and probably before then. So, no, the, everybody's been running, but the government knows who's going to win. Now, supposedly, that goes from certainly from George H.W. Bush to Biden. So, I mean, I think it's the post-early 70s in which they've had quantum access, allowing them to know who's going to be present. I think they decided to tell the people just so they could psychologically adjust to their destiny being the leader of the free world. Sure. Now, Harry Truman said when he found out that Franklin Roosevelt had died, that he felt all the stars in the heavens had fallen to earth and landed on his shoulders. And uh, other presidents have made similar comments. So I think it's such a momentous job and destiny that they just said, well, we'll, we'll benefit the government function by just letting the, uh, the future presidents know what their destinies are. For all we know, the alcoholism that George W. Bush struggled with, pretty much from around the time I met him, and he was, what, about 25, to the presidency, was because he had been told. Not just that he would be president one day, but after his father was. That must have been pretty disturbing information. For sure. Especially if he, he was... was somewhat of a simp <laughs> trying to wrap his mind around having so much responsibility uh, probably messed with his head a little bit. Yes, and I guess he figured, well, geez, I'm going to be the second American after John Quincy Adams to have had a father who was president. Mm -hmm. Going to make comparisons and so forth. Sure. And, you know, his dad was fairly smart, also a Yale graduate. But he did graduate from Yale and Harvard Business School, so he's not a dummy. <laughs> or, he got, said, or he got or he got ushered through. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's what they've been doing. And you know, Alfred Weber has written a book called The Chronogarchy, uh, suggesting that there's this elaborate oligarchy that's exploiting quantum access. And I don't believe there is. I don't really believe there's been any continuity between the days of Pegasus and the present. If there was, they would have contacted me, and they have not. So would have contacted Obama, and by now we would have found out something. And uh, I know he knew, because at the going away party for the Mars training course, he and his putative mother, uh, Stanley Ann Dunham, we're telling all of us, look, we know he's going to be the first black president of the United States. 
And that was 1980. That was, what, 28 years before Obama was elected. Wow. This thing would have leaked out by now. Yeah. But I can, as, some, as the other person who was told in 1980 that I had such a destiny, nobody's contacted me, so I, I don't believe there's a chronic argument. I believe they, the uh, intel community will approach somebody and tell them that she used my dad in 1980. But in the intervening 43 years, has somebody approached me who is not my dad, but who has some kind of position that will cause me to trust what they're saying? No. All of the education I got, my decision to run in 2016, that was all personal and volitional. It, had, it wasn't done at the request of anybody. So I don't believe there's a chronic argument. I think they would have thought it would have been unconstitutional to develop such such a such an oligarchy that would be exploiting quantum access to control the American people or, or what have you. What are your thoughts about where the technology is now? Well, we're talking a lot about technology from you know fifty years ago, do you think that they have continued to advance or develop this technology? With possible setbacks, I know that in the mid-1970s, after my dad and I left the program in 72, they had some kind of event where somebody was coming into work and had a heart attack. So the reporting requirement within Project Pegasus fell apart. But they had to have gotten their act together again because that would explain why when we jumped through the teleporter in 71 and arrived accidentally in 1991, they were able to get us home 2,000 miles and 20 years. So by 91, they had the capability to teleport again. I think now that 30 years or more have passed since then. I mean, we know from Ben Rich of Lockheed that they're leaving the solar system. Um, but uh, I'm sure the technology has advanced, but I have no knowledge of anything going on in the government because I left, I left government service in 1984 after three years on Project Mars, or four years on Project Mars. 19, July of 1981 to August of 1984. So I have no idea what they're up to. You, you mentioned there being eight modalities of time travel. What, what are those? Well, um, there was remote viewing. Mm -hmm. uh, there was spinning to induce out-of-body experiences of astral time travel. And uh, there was the Montauk chair, which sent us to moments in our own subjective future. But they ultimately found that the Montauk chair acts as a tripartite potential destiny. Just like when you're in a room and you go out in a hallway connected to the room, you can make a left, you can make a right, or you can go back into the room and not go into the hall, right? So they found that a lot of choice making is tripartite. You can get your first college choice, your alternate, or decide not to go to college and get a job or go to the military. Or something. So I remember that discussion that they found at the Montauk chair was um, arriving not at inevitable uh, potential futures, but a choice among three leading alternate. Then there was Tesla teleportation. There was chronovision, not along the lines of what Ernetti and Gemelli originally developed, which was like a TV screen, but when they sent it on to Bell Labs in this country, they developed cubicle holograms um, and uh, plasma confinement. And um, that was the way they sent me to Gettysburg. And uh, 
on November 19th of 1863. And, um, you know, there was third degree chronovision, fourth degree chronovision, uh, and, uh, plasma confinement, and, uh, and also the aeronautical repositioning chamber, which they used to send us to the red planet. In an extremely short period of time, I mean, we were getting to Mars anywhere from like 10 to 20 minutes, wow. which seems possible. So the bottom line is our government has technology that we were told when we were kids on the project um, was 200 years ahead of what the people thought had been developed. That's, I think, why I was sort of threatened or warned in 2003 by the representative of the executive office of the president, President George W. Bush, do not talk about these technologies. And you've suffered no repercussions because of talking about it. Have you received any death threats or? No, but I mean, I was targeted with a directed energy weapon after the 2016 election and I went to Washington state to resume my law practice. Uh, and then as a result, I developed uh, kidney failure and legal blindness. Wow. So we don't really know if that was some idiot acting like he was doing something or that was some operative who was targeting. Me. But no, uh, after I began Speaking out when I had been advised not to, it looks like what they decided to do because they couldn't kill me after like the first 100 radio shows and yeah. five TV shows because uh-huh. it would draw attention to what I was talking about. They tried a different approach, which was to flood the field with what I call exo hoaxers. That was that whole phenomenon of all those SSP claimants, you know, the, the Randy Kramers. Corey Good and so forth. Mm-hmm. There's been a lot of them. Yes. The idea being, if, look, if we if we sponsor 20 surrogates to Andy, nobody will really know what's gone on. We do know that, you know, Corey Good has now admitted that he was lying in court and uh, Randy Kramer has been proven to be a liar. He gave two names for the, the wife that died in his arms on Mars from a predator attack. And his most famous recent comment from December of uh, December 17th of last year was that ETs are coming here because we make the best beer in the galaxy. What? Which I, I think it was a little bit to uh, Steven Spielberg's uh, film E.T. the Extraterrestrial where <laughs> E.T. Gets, uh, gets drunk. Yes. Um, they're getting more and more ridiculous but I was criticized for framing what I call the exo hoaxers. For example, the fact that the publisher of Zachariah Sitchin, Barbara Hand Clow, had him investigated and found that he was a science fiction writer who didn't even know Sumerian. So how could he frame his stories of the Anunnaki? And, uh, but, I think that, in fact, the phenomenon of the exo hoaxers was worse than I framed it. I was the target, okay? They wanted to flood the field with 20 bullshit artists Mm -hmm. so that they could discern what the truth was. Because I have completely adhered to the truth. I followed the Mark Twain principle. Always tell the truth. That that way you don't have to remember anything. Exactly. Okay? And... um, I've got, what was his name? Uh, uh, David John Oates, the benighted uh, reverse speech guy, saying recently on Jeff Rentz's program that I've been lying. I haven't been. I have been scrupulously adhering to the truth, so much so that the deep state put anywhere from 10 to 20 complete storytellers in motion. And even sponsor them financially. Like I was at a an event sponsored by Robert Potter in Shasta City in 2014. 
I and other guests were paid $100 for appearing. So where did Robert get 20000 for Corey Good? Mm-hmm. Uh, what I'm saying is that I have been told by somebody with ties to Army Intelligence, look, Andy, you know, I, I, I don't think they're so uh, happy that you talk, but it really doesn't matter now because they put about 10 to 20 people in motion to absolutely confuse the public about the, this area. And, and by the way, they never mentioned me, even though I, I essentially kicked off the literature of the SSP in, uh, in August of 2009 with a public appearance. Um, so, you know, I, I kicked off the time travel stuff in October of 04 with a lecture, uh, at a Shiloh Inn at, uh, Portland, Oregon. But I've had, in other words, a disclosure that all of these periodically lauded figures were actually disinformants put in motion to obscure my unwelcomed revelation about time travel and Mars visitation going back 20 years. So actually my concern about the XL hoaxers, it, it ends up being worse than I thought. Yes, they are XO hoaxers, not necessarily Sitchin, but people like, you know, Randy Kramer and Corey Good. I mean, does anybody really believe Tony Rodriguez's claim that his involvement with extraterrestrials involved building stars. I mean, come on. So what people have to understand is that these were disinformants that were put in motion to obscure the testimony of truth tellers like myself. And specifically that U S Intel has already confirmed to me with specific names that, yes, Andy, these were put in motion so that nobody has any chance of understanding the truth, the truth that you were sharing. So it looks like you're not in any physical danger anymore. As long as people can listen to a Corey Good or a Tony Rodriguez or a Randy Kramer with a straight face and listen to these absolutely absurd claims, what the claim of a of a Solomon Berg that the ship he used to get into space was powered by an atomic blast, and oh, oh, and the ship wasn't destroyed, <laughs> uh, then um, you're safe because the the deep state has succeeded in completely mudding the water, and that looks like what has happened. A truth teller with ties to Army Intelligence, Army Special Forces, who likes and admires me, told me that this is, in fact, what's been going on. But if you look at the followership, I know fairly intelligent people who still believe Corey Good, for example, mm. and Court admitted that he was channeling his information. He's admitted fabricating it. Okay, so there's a weird kind of cultic followership of these bullshitters that were put in motion to obscure the truth. I don't understand it. It's almost like fandom in television shows. I mean, I can understand being a fan of Star Trek or The X-Files. But when somebody has assumed a public position and then admitted that they were making everything up, why are people clinging to still believing them? After they've made what we call in the law admissions against interest or confession. So I, I don't get it. I think it's a desire to be right. And and there's the, the ego is so deeply entrenched with the story that people don't want to admit that they could potentially have been duped. And yeah, it, it, I, uh, Hunter, I think that's a good point. I, it kind of reminds me of the Vax. 
they don't want to admit that they were given something potentially injurious mm-hmm. and doesn't prevent them from getting COVID-19. I mean, I see the same sort of weird cultic mentality. What an yeah. honor and a pleasure it has been to speak to you, Andrew. I have just so enjoyed this. And I I Thanks. really look forward to you coming back on the show because we do have so many more questions that we would like to ask you. All right, we'll save those for my next appearance, but I'd be happy to re- reappear. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, how about I give you a call when this goes live, which will be a few weeks down the road, and then maybe we can we can book something then. Sure. Okay. Well, Andrew, such uh, a great opportunity to speak with you and wonderful meeting you with a little more in-depth conversation, and uh, we definitely look forward to, to more in the future. And where can the listeners oh, yeah, find yeah. you? Yes. Well, my my podcasts are being posted at Andy for America on Facebook, which is the residual platform from my 2016 presidential campaign. Mm-hmm. Is that the number I'm, four or spelled out? No, no, the word uh, four, F- okay. F-O-R. Okay. Uh, and my time travel stuff tends to get posted also at Project Pegasus, um, my time travel group on Facebook. Fabulous. Wonderful. Feel free to post this or these these pods at Andy for America on, on Facebook. We'll definitely do that. We're on Facebook too, so I can we can definitely cross pollinate that. Uh, Andrew, have a, a fantastic rest of your afternoon. And like I said, I'll give you a call in a few weeks when this is getting ready to go out, and uh, we can we can talk about having you on again. All right, just give me a call, Chris. Yeah, happy to. Yeah, likewise. All right, we'll uh, take okey-doke. take care of yourself, and we'll talk down the road. All right, cheerio. Farewell. Wow. <laughs> I told you. I told yeah. you. Uh, didn't we see uh, Andrew in the a Frank Jacob? Yeah, briefly. Um, yeah, I was yeah. hoping he would be in there more, but yeah, he made an appearance in yeah. uh, Packing for Mars. Yeah. Yes. Super cool. Yeah. I really, really enjoyed this interview. And, you know, it's it's not a contest by any stretch of the imagination and you can't really compare people's experiences but my instinct and and just my vibe with Andrew is that he is a credible person Absolutely. He has the receipts. <laughs> Let's just Definitely. say that. Yeah. And he really has no reason he's not He's not uh, trying to sell you books or get you to subscribe to anything or anything like that. He's not trying to make money off of this. Uh, And who would, again, as I've said with many people that we have on that have stories that many people would just say are too outlandish to remotely take serious, uh, why would you put yourself out there with this kind of you know, talking about these kinds of experiences that you've had and be lying about it. Like he doesn't seem to be somebody who would get something from that form of deception, any deception whatsoever. Uh, Yeah. He seems totally credible. And I've heard many interviews with him throughout the years and he's not wavered from anything that he said at all. Uh, He always is saying the same thing over and over and over again and is very determined that he's, yeah, that he's had actually had these experiences. Yeah, it's exciting to to speak to someone that has such a interesting history and that doesn't seem like a kook. <laughs> you know, he doesn't seem like he's trying to prove anything. Well, he doesn't seem like he's insane. <laughs> he really, no, not at all. I really, I really got the vibe from him that. He is a level-headed, smart person who has had an extremely unusual life. And I'm so curious about the actual experiences, you know, like, where did you land? What, you know, what was the, what was your physical state when you arrived there? What, you know, like, how do you slip 
in and out of these timelines and the and these realities like how does that work yeah like, exactly you know i think the challenge for me with this type of an interview is doing it over the phone and not I'm such a visual person, like to be able to look at him would have been very helpful. Um, But he is just such a astute and accurate um, navigator in the story that it, it was extremely easy to follow. I just, I have so many questions. Yeah, me too. I mean, he, he's, he talks in big chunks. So sometimes I'll, you know, a few questions will pop up in the middle of what he's saying, but I certainly don't want to interrupt his train of thought. I want him to complete what he's saying. Um, But, you know, by then, by the end of when he's done speaking, the question doesn't seem to be that relevant or I've gotten distracted by all the interesting things that he's been talking about and, and want to, you know, ask several more questions uh, having to do with where it all ended up. Yeah, I wanted to ask him about, um, you know, I, it was good to to discuss like the uh, Draco stuff and reptilians and, you know, but of course th- there's the stuff that's like in the news, like about human trafficking and where that falls mm-hmm. in all of this and just the state of uh the world and the state of the United States and how, you know, we, we have these really what seem to be divisive subjects like the jab, um, homelessness, like, like how do all of these things fit into this picture? I wanted to ask him about MK ultra and, you know, just all the stuff that we like to talk about. I, I want to, I want to drill into that. Um, because I do think that these, just from my own research and, and my own experience, I am certain that these projects exist. What I, my curiosity is, is what is the end game of all of them? Like what, like usually if a scientist is doing an experiment, it's to prove a hypothesis. So what my question is is what is the point like where are they where's the government headed with all of this yeah absolutely um gosh, dang it that what i was going to say is completely just left my mind right as you ended that i oh, wanted sorry. to ask him about flat earth mm-hmm. what is oh go ahead uh he by by having run uh, for president, and I'm not. I, I wanted to dig into that too, and we will. Um, he obviously is someone, and by the way that he speaks, that has some sort of respect for the government, mm-hmm. the institute of of, of government, um, which I'm fascinated by too, because I, I respect his viewpoint, I respect his experiences, um, and I also respect the fact that, you know, as much as we talk about this sort of stuff in the truth community, whatever the fuck that is, um, and come to these conclusions. Um, you know, I think sometimes we we might be filling in the gaps. I'm not saying all the time. I'm not, I'm not saying what times we might be filling in the gaps, but I think it's easy to do that. And especially when we all huddle up in a group and go, yeah, yeah, that's what's going on. Yeah, that's exactly what their motivations are. But I think in that frenzy, sometimes we we lose sight of the presence of nuance. Nuance is in everything, even in the kind of stuff that we're talking about that seems very black and white sometimes. There's a lot of stuff in there that falls between the cracks and that is in the shades of gray in between the white and the black. Um, but it gets it gets very becomes very easy sometimes to get worked up into a frenzy about all the stuff that we think is going on. And maybe it is going on, but maybe it isn't going on, or maybe it's going on in a completely different context or, or fashion than we speculate. So I think it's it's incredibly important to keep an open mind. Um, and I really want to hear Andrew's take on, on government and why he even thought that was a worthwhile 
uh, pursuit and, uh, you know, why he seems to have that respect for that institution that many of us have written off as hopelessly, myself very much included, hopelessly corrupt. Well, I don't think it's all of one thing. Yeah. And I think that that's what is important to um, remember when we're considering these large institutions. It's like saying, you know, this is the ongoing discussion that you and I are having about education. It's like saying college isn't worthwhile. Well, that's not true. There's there's a lot of value in going to a university. There's a lot of value, I think, in government. There's a lot of value in groups. It is the bad actors. It's the people that have a malintent or n- nefarious uh, designs that are involved that I think that poison these institutions and these groups. So I don't think that everyone in the government is a bad person. I think perhaps what his intention was, was to expose, you know, these cancers and maybe do something to propel, uh, the United States forward by exposing this stuff. Because I think in my, from my perspective, I think one of the reasons that governments don't do full disclosure with aliens or Sasquatches or, or um, any, anything that would be considered kind of a fringe conspiracy is because there's this idea that the American public or the world not just the American public, but the world in general would not be able to handle um, these these concepts. And so the way that they control, they keep control over humanity is by, you know, as he said, soft disclosure or putting these things in films or in music or in other art where you, you kind of... Um, identify it and you see it and you see what the message is but it's not kind of thrown in your face and suddenly you say oh well where does this leave religion or where does this leave spirituality so uh and do we have power you know i think that's the other aspect of it is a desire to keep control and power uh and to seem powerful for sure I love it when I go on this rant and you go, for sure. <laughs> it's hilarious. It's true. It's why I say more than needs to be said. Like, I'm a person of few words um, most of the time, and that's just because a few words will do it, um, not because I feel like I need to go on and on and on about something. Do I have a retort to that, or did that send me off in a direction? I'm not not anything that I can think of to add to that. Um, but uh, I do think that there's a lot of, uh, a, a, just a wealth of experience that uh, Andrew has had that I would love to uh, unpack with him and including things that I've not heard asked on many of the interviews and conversations that I've heard with him. And I would like to give a shout out to Randy Moggins for hooking us up with Andrew uh, Bishago um, which is where the I first heard uh, Andrew talk on Off Planet Radio and was totally blown away. And he was kind enough to introduce us. And so here we are talking with Andrew Bashago. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, it was great. For sure. Uh, I really enjoyed and I would love to find more, you know, in, in these situations, I like to kind of go to another, go into a different direction. And I wanted to know more about his parents. I wanted to know, you know, did he talk to his father? Uh, Was his father um, ever interviewed? Did he ever, like, because I think there's an old guard thing with people of a certain generation where they were trained not to speak and, they were given access to things that they they would never speak about. And so the fact that he and his dad were able to speak about these 
um, situations was very fascinating to me. And I was just curious about as his father aged and as Andrew aged, did they continue to have these discussions? And, you know, did they did they ever like go back and say, wow, that was really weird when dot, dot, dot happened? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, did he ever interview him or would he ever write a book about his father? Because his father sounds like an extremely interesting person. And I wanted to know more about him. Exactly. I think when you have somebody talking about experiences as vastly uh, out of the spectrum of, of consensus reality as Andrew's are, it's also easy to gap fill. So you can say, "I well, we went to this time period and we did this and that and the other. But, you know, having the opportunity to speak to somebody who's actually, who's actually there and has had those experiences makes me want to talk about things. Like that's when, look, when he was talking about Gettysburg and like, what did it smell like? Like, what, what is it, you know, what did it feel like there? Like, I just can't imagine what that would be like. Uh, which maybe you know, oddly enough, it's maybe not that different. Just people were more well dressed and and more articulate, perhaps. Um, but it's those little details that I would love for him to expound upon uh, that I feel like get brushed aside in a lot of conversations about this stuff because they just want the more spectacular aspects of everything, which I find obviously highly fascinating too. But. <clears throat> time travel is always something that comes back again and again and again as, as far as things that I, subjects that I feel myself drawn to. Um, and so Andrew seems like a very, very good source for sort of mining that topic uh, as someone who has had firsthand experience with it. Yeah, I wanted to talk to him about firmament and the 70 species of uh alien and you know i i'm interested in that 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 uh aspect as well and just his his thoughts about interstellar travel and the possibility of that you know from a technological aspect perhaps it is possible for uh beings or um, aliens to be coming from other um, solar systems because they're using a different form of technology that we don't have access to or mm-hmm. or we don't understand. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Can't wait for the next Super one. Super cool. Yeah. Um, he was great. I'm going to start booking interviews for next year, next January, as we're pretty tight for this year so far in mid October, I can say that we definitely have enough shows booked and soon recorded to take us into next year. Um, but yeah, we're the idea is that we're going to try to take the last half of November and all of December off as far as doing interviews are concerned. Obviously, I'll still be working to actually put these episodes out, putting them together and editing them and so forth. But um, yeah, I'm going to start, I'm kind of making a list of people that I want to invite back. Um, and Andrew is definitely on the top of that list. Yeah, it would be cool to have he and Tony on at the same time, <laughs> get, get into a little a debate, little discussion. You know? Yeah, the jury is out for me as far as Tony is concerned, too, just to quickly touch on that. Uh, because, yeah, crazy outlandish experiences, too. Um, but I'm always the kind of person that wants to listen to those kinds of things. Sure. Not just for the sake of it, but yeah. like because I think sometimes the person that everybody labels as the k- total kook, it may be the only one that has any idea of what's really going on about something. Yeah, uh, or may not. Or may not, yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> May, May is the operative word. Yeah. Um, but also because of what Farsight uh, said, there's supposedly there's a three hour uh, remote compilation, remote viewing sessions going into Tony's experience, and they actually interacted with some of his experiences um, in ways that I'm not wholeheartedly familiar with. I just heard it intimated in different conversations. So that to me lends a little bit of legitimacy to it because I respect the Farsight Institute and we just, the Courtney episode just came out um, and remote viewing in general. Uh, 
So, yeah, I'm still not completely ready to mark Tony off. I've, I've asked him to come on again because he's released a new book because I still want to hear what he has to say. So, yeah. yeah, interesting to hear Andrew's take on that. Yeah, I know. I The jury's out for me with the Farsight Institute. I'm not necessarily a hardcore uh, believer. We watched some of the some episodes and i don't know it's a it's a giant question mark for me i so i i wouldn't necessarily say that that their corroboration is somehow a receipt i wouldn't necessarily look at it that way i wasn't um i'm not saying you are i'm just saying for me i i wouldn't necessarily say that so but there you have it. This Again, is what's great about being with you is that we can have different perspectives. For sure. Uh, and I've listened to hours and hours of Farsight stuff. So I think like most areas of life, it's good to immerse yourself uh, as opposed to just dipping your toe into something, immersing yourself in it and getting a broader um, picture, snapshot of what, somebody or some group of people are doing so i feel like i have more to go by than just what i have lots more to go by than what just you and i witnessed so that's why that's what i'm drawing from yeah um okay well i think that covers it it do cool uh thank you all so very much for listening um you can reach us at the melt podcast at protonmail.com and hunter hyphen muse at protonmail.com and um, there's such such great stuff coming so thank you all for listening thank you all so very much for supporting we are obviously not obviously but i should say we are on locals too uh, for many of you who have had issues with patreon or you just don't want to give your cut of your hard-earned money to patreon um, locals is much more supportive uh, to folks like us and free speech in general. So we're there too. All of the links you need are in the episode notes. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for making it this far. If you've liked what you've heard and are thus inspired to contribute to the well-being of the melt, there are a few easy ways to do that. The most tangible being financially, which can be achieved by clicking the Locals or Patreon link in the episode notes, and then you will be led through the process of starting your monthly subscription for a mere $5 a month. This will give you access to exclusive episodes, full-length episodes, and you can participate in our monthly Melt meetups, where we can congregate together as a community and often get a chance to chat with some of our guests more intimately. Another way to help out would be to go to wherever it is that you listen to the Melt and leave a favorable review or rating. You can also spread the word via sharing or recommendation to friends and family, either in person or virtually. And lastly, 
If none of those options are readily available or appealing to you, simply send your positive thoughts and intentions. In an interconnected and quantumly entangled multiverse, these also go a long way. Thank you.